Washington, D.C. and to all of you who have joined us in New York City. This afternoon, we are pleased to host an inter... Thank you. <laughs> this afternoon, we are pleased to host an interagency panel of senior U.S. government officials to preview the 2016 Nuclear Security Summit, which will take place from March 31st to April 1st here in Washington, D.C. Our briefers today include Laura Holgate, Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Weapons of Mass Destruction, Terrorism, and Threat Reduction for the National Security Council. Ms. Holgate oversees and coordinates the development of national policies and programs to reduce global threats from nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. She also acts as U.S. Sherpa to the Nuclear Security Summits and co-leads the effort to advance the President's global health security agenda. We are also pleased to welcome Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Energy. The Deputy Secretary has served as second in command at the Energy Department since October 2014. She joined President Obama's administration on day one, serving from 2009 to 2013 as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council, and from 2013 to 2014 as White House Coordinator for Defense Policy, Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction and Arms Control. We are also very pleased to welcome Rose Gattemuller, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security at the Department of State. As Under Secretary, Ms. Gattemuller advises the Secretary of State on arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament. She previously served as Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Arms Control, Verification and Compliance, and was the Chief U.S. Negotiator of the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the New START, with the Russian Federation, which entered into force on February 5th, 2011. And we're also very pleased to welcome Dr. Huban Gawadia, Director, Domestic Nuclear Detection Office of the Department of Homeland Security. The Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, known as DNDO, serves as the lead federal agency mandated to develop and enhance radiological and nuclear detection and national technical nuclear forensics capabilities. We will begin with remarks from each of our briefers, after which I will open the floor for questions. Ms. Holgate, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's great to be here at the Foreign Press Center, and I appreciate this chance to give a preview of what's going to be happening here in Washington over the next few days with the President's convening of the 2016 Nuclear Security Summit. The Obama administration's focus on nuclear security is part of a comprehensive nuclear policy presented by the President in Prague in 2009. In that speech, President Obama described a four-pronged agenda to pursue a world without nuclear weapons. He laid out new U.S. policies and initiatives towards nuclear disarmament, nuclear nonproliferation, nuclear security, and nuclear energy. As you all know well, roughly 2,000 metric tons of nuclear weapons usable materials, highly enriched uranium and plutonium, are present in both civilian and military programs worldwide. And we know that terrorists have the intent and the capability to turn these raw materials into a nuclear device if they were to gain access to them. What we did not know in 2009 was that the rise of ISIL and its WMD ambitions. Unfortunately, their chemical weapons attacks in Iraq and Syria have shown their utter disregard for human life, much less international norms. A terrorist attack with an improvised nuclear device would create political, economic, social, psychological, and environmental havoc around the world, no matter where such attack occurs. The threat is global. The impact of a nuclear terrorist attack would be global, and the solutions must therefore also be global. The President's call in Prague was intended to reinvigorate existing bilateral and multilateral efforts and to challenge nations to re-examine their own commitments to nuclear security. World leaders have no greater responsibility to their own people and their neighbors than to secure nuclear materials and prevent nuclear terrorism. The Nuclear Security Summit process has been a centerpiece of these efforts. Since the first summit in April 2010 here in Washington, D.C., President Obama and more than 50 world leaders have been working together to prevent nuclear terrorism and counter nuclear smuggling through the nuclear security summits. 
This summit community has built an impressive track record in meaningful progress towards nuclear security and on actions that back up our words. Collectively, summit participants have made over 260 national commitments in the first three summits, and nearly three quarters of those commitments have already been implemented. These outcomes, whether in the form of nuclear material removed or eliminated, treaties ratified and implemented, reactors converted, regulations strengthened, centers of excellence launched, technologies upgraded, capabilities enhanced, these are all tangible, concrete evidence of improved nuclear security. The international community has made it harder than ever for terrorists to acquire nuclear weapons, and that has made us all more secure. The summit's success has been built on the personal attention of national leaders, a focus on tangible and meaningful outcomes, and on being a regular event that elicits new commitments and achievements, and a forum that builds relationships that can help advance joint efforts. Looking beyond this last summit, we need to find ways to capture some of these attributes in more lasting vehicles to promote nuclear security progress. The summits were in fact designed explicitly to enhance, elevate, expand, and empower an architecture of treaties, institutions, norms, and practices to effectively address the threats we face today and in the future. As the, 200, as the 2016 Nuclear Security Summit represents the last summit in this format, we will issue five action plans in support of the key enduring institutions and initiatives related to nuclear security. Those are the United Nations, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Interpol, the Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism, and the Global Partnership. These action plans represent steps the summit participants will take as members of these organizations to support their enhanced role in nuclear security going forward. Another important component of their summit's success has been the effective network of Sherpas, the senior government officials and experts in each summit country who cut across multiple agencies to form a tight-knit community of action. This community will be carried forward after the 2016 summit as a nuclear security contact group that will meet regularly to synchronize efforts to implement commitments made in the four summit communiques, national statements, gift baskets, and action plans. Recognizing the interest from those who've not been part of the summit process, this contact group will be open to countries who wish to promote the summit agenda. As much as we have accomplished through the summit process, more work remains. We, are, we all need to do more together to enhance nuclear security performance, to dissuade and apprehend nuclear traffickers, to eliminate excess nuclear materials and weapons, to avoid production of materials that we cannot use, to make sure our facilities can repel the full range of threats that we have already seen in our neighborhoods, to share experiences and best practices, and to do so that is in ways that are visible to friends, neighbors, and rivals, and thereby provide assurance that we are effectively executing our sovereign responsibilities. We also need to reflect the principle of continuous improvement, because nuclear security is never done. As long as materials exist, they require our utmost commitment to their protection. And I look forward to discussing these ideas with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, Deputy Secretary. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here as well. And uh, I was actually in the sunny square in Prague in uh, 2009 when President Obama uh, set forth his Prague agenda. And I just want to note that Laura Holgate has been the uh, creator of this whole process and has been the idea generator who has made all of those accomplishments possible. I want to pause and <laughs> give you credit as we enter into this fourth and final summit of the President's leadership because the world is safer as a result of what Laura has given her life to doing. Thank you, Laura. We are in your debt. Uh, I had the privilege of working with Laura at the White House when I was the coordinator for WMD and I served as the Sherpa in 2014 for the Netherlands, uh, the yeah. summit hosted by the Netherlands. And subsequent to that, I went over to the Department of Energy to become the Deputy Secretary. And my role today is to tell you about what we do at the Department of Energy to support the nuclear security summit process. Um, the Department of Energy has uh, a responsibility for both the 
uh, provision of the nuclear deterrent to our nation as well as the advancement of our nonproliferation agenda. And our National Nuclear Security Administration, which is an element of the Department of Energy, is responsible for implementation of those duties. The NNSA is the uh, acronym, NNSA is the acronym for that part of the Department of Energy that has these responsibilities. And uh, we work very closely with partners around the world, the many countries that are involved in the Nuclear Security Summit process in particular, on removals of uh, fissile materials, on counterterrorism cooperation, on radiation detection, on forensics, and on emergency response. I'm going to focus on what we have done uh, since the start of the summit process to give you uh, an appreciation of the ways in which we provide support uh, around the world to the advancement of this agenda. Because our Department of Energy has unique capabilities in its scientists and engineers who work across the United States in 17 national laboratories and a number of other facilities and provide the technical support that is necessary to achieve our goals in nuclear security. These specialists are the most powerful tool that we have against the nuclear security threats that Laura described. So here are some examples of the work that we have done at the Department of Energy through our NNSA to support the summit process. We have helped to establish a number of nuclear security centers of excellence. Most recently, we opened a nuclear security center of excellence in China. The Chinese government made a commitment through the summit process to do this, and our Secretary of Energy, Secretary Moniz, was in China last week uh, to celebrate the opening of that center of excellence. We have minimized the civilian use, use of highly enriched uranium, HEU, through the conversion of research reactors around the world to low enriched uranium, or LEU. We have deployed radiation equipment around the world to combat nuclear smuggling. And we have secured and removed radiological materials that could be used by terrorists. We have also removed or confirmed disposition of more than 3,800 kilograms of vulnerable nuclear material, enough for more than 150 nuclear weapons. Additionally, we have installed radiation detection equipment in 36 partner countries to include border crossings, airports, and seaports to combat illicit trafficking of nuclear materials. And just in this last year, this equipment was used to identify and stop four cesium-137 sources at a European port. Uh, this was mixed into lead scrap, and the sources were able to be removed and stored appropriately to prevent a huge risk of radioactive contamination. So it's success stories like this that motivate us to keep working uh, in conjunction with our State Department and Homeland Security partners to ensure the safety of the American people as well as all of our allies and partners around the world who are working together with us to prevent and counter the risk of nuclear terrorism. Undersecretary. Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here today to see so many uh, colleagues from the media world in the audience, so thank you very much for coming. I also have to say what a huge pleasure it is to appear on this podium with my very esteemed colleagues from across the interagency, so thank you to the Foreign Press Center for this opportunity. I wanted to pick up on some points uh, that Liz Sherwood Randall was making and Laura Holgate about the way this is a very pragmatic and practical-minded effort, as we like to say, we are tackling the severe problem of nuclear terrorism, nuclear materials or radiological materials falling into the hands of terrorists uh, in a very pragmatic and problem-solving way. I like to think of it as fence by fence, facility by facility, operator by operator. Across the world, we have been working with countries to ensure that we are minimizing the presence of fissile material. Another way to, to think about the, the data that Liz provided is to say that we have achieved a 50 percent reduction uh, in uh, the uh, number of countries holding highly enriched uranium or separated plutonium since the start of this process. And, and as Laura said in her remarks, our work is never done, so we will be continuing to press forward with these efforts. But we have really worked hard in a very pragmatic and problem-solving way. Uh, Liz also touched on what we have done to enhance physical protection 
uh, but also to build up the capabilities of countries to protect their borders against s nuclear smuggling, against uh, trafficking in nuclear or fissile materials, radiological sources, and that has been very important. I was astonished to learn that we've actually put uh, uh, radiation detection equipment at 329 international border crossings, airports, and seaports throughout the, the processes uh, that were put in train by the Nuclear Security Summit. But one point from my uh, seat in the State Department that I wanted to emphasize for you also is that when we embarked on these efforts, many of the countries participating did not have a very clear sense of what they needed to do on the, on the legal front to tackle this problem. In many countries, you know, possession of nuclear material for sale was not a crime. So another area that we have put a lot of emphasis on is improving our ability not only to locate smuggled material and find the nuclear smugglers, but also to bring them to justice. And that has been a very important aspect of, of the work underway. We have been working very hard, for example, um, in enhancing this international understanding to bring some important, uh, uh, some important uh, conventions uh, into force. We're working on the Convention on the Physical Protection of Lu Nuclear Materials, the 2005 amendment, to, uh, to get that into force. And we've had a great deal of success in that effort, of which you'll be hearing more in the coming days. So I just wanted to add uh, to what uh, Laura and Liz said by, by really emphasizing this part of the equation, that we have done a lot to raise awareness, and a awareness at the highest levels among the top leaders of the countries participating in the necessity of a clear legal basis to work these problems, to bring smugglers to justice, to ensure that, in fact, we are putting people uh, behind bars if they deserve to be because they have been engaging in this kind of smuggling practice. So it's another facet. I'd like to uh, pass the floor over now to my DHS colleague who would like to talk to you about work that's being done inside our own borders on this very important problem. Thank you, Rose. Thanks for that nice tee up. Um, I, I too am, am genuinely pleased to be here today, and I would like to echo the sentiments of, of my colleagues from across the United States government. Uh, the nuclear security summits have been an invaluable mechanism to generate awareness for the challenging mission that Laura set forth for us today, and have resulted in tangible progress for nuclear security programs worldwide. The summits have provided a key platform for the Department of Homeland Security's pursuit of nuclear security for which we have both domestic and international responsibilities. Um, every day, the Department of Homeland Security's Customs and Border Protection officers scan nearly 100% of maritime containerized cargo and all truck barn cargo and uh, personal vehicles for radiation before they enter into the United States. All Coast Guard boarding parties carry radiation detection equipment which is also true for the Transportation Security Administration's VIPER teams, or the Visible Intermodal Prevention and Response teams. Also within DHS, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, also known as FEMA, prepares for the contingency of, for nuclear incidents, and our National Protection and Programs Directorate works to secure and enhance the resilience of the nuclear sector, including facilities and materials under regulatory control. Now, my office, the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, or DNDO, as you heard, has two principal uh, areas of responsibility, nuclear forensics and nuclear detection. And we advance the state of the art for both through risk assessments, planning, and information sharing, training and exercises, research development, test and evaluation, and by acquiring and deploying detectors mm -hmm. for use by our operational partners. Now, we do all of this in close cooperation with our partners from across the nuclear security enterprise, from the Department of Energy's national laboratories, our federal partners, academia, inter industry, state and local agencies, certainly partner nations, and international agencies such as the International Atomic Energy Agency. Now, our work in the international area in particular has benefited and also benefited from the nuclear security summits. At each summit, international collaboration in nuclear forensics has been promoted, and these collaborations have resulted in education and training curricula for practitioners. We have conducted multilateral tabletop exercises and created a lexicon and a knowledge platform for the community. The summits have also promoted national-level security architectures. 
We're going beyond the borders to introduce detection capabilities to combat illicit trafficking and the malevolent use of nuclear and other radioactive materials. Moving forward, the summits will rely on international organizations and constructs such as the IAEA, Interpol, and the Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism, with whom we have enjoyed productive partnerships. For instance, we have worked closely with our partner nations through the IAE and the Global Initiative to develop and promulgate best practices for developing and implementing nuclear detection architectures, as well as national technical forensics capabilities. We look forward to the new era in nuclear security brought about by the summit series, which has given momentum to our future bilateral and multilateral efforts. At the Department of Homeland Security, we have appreciated the global attention the summits have brought to the threat of nuclear terrorism, and we will continue to share our experiences in training and exercise, the conduct of operations, and developing and fielding technologies with our international partners and by enhancing our capabilities at the borders and within the United States, we will endeavor to make nuclear terrorism prohibitively difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Well, I'm pleased to open for questions. I'm going to ask that we kindly wait for the microphone and please state your name and media outlet. For those journalists who are attending in New York, I kindly invite you to your podium if you have a question and I'll do my best to make sure that I get to you uh, in due time. So we'll start out, yes, in the front and the blue, please. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Xue Jiao from China Central Television. Um, as we know, the United States and China has many cooperation in nuclear area. Um, and what do you think um, China, the role of China plays in this nuclear security summit? And what is the potential range of cooperation between U.S. and China um, after that? Because we know President Xi and Obama will have a bilateral meeting uh, this time. Thank you. Well, we're very very pleased that uh, President Xi is coming uh, to the summit, and uh, we're really uh, quite encouraged by the leadership that China is beginning to show in the nuclear security realm, not only in managing its own material, but in creating a platform for cooperation regionally and internationally through the center of excellence uh, that it's been carrying out. And this is just one, one milestone in a history of U.S.-Chinese uh, nuclear cooperation, and maybe Liz can say more about some of the other work that's been done in that realm. But this is not the beginning. This is, this is something that we've been working on for some time. But one of the things that we're very um, pleased about is the, the role that China's showing in terms of cooperating with other countries uh, and internationally on the nuclear security issue. And we hope to, to share that partnership uh, and to see Chinese leadership in that realm uh, in, increase even further. Okay, yes, in a second, sir. Hi, uh, this is Jalil Afdi from Frontier Post. Um, as Laura said that uh, there is a great threat that uh, people like ISL might uh, get a hold on uh, uh, nuclear uh, weapons uh, uh, to be used for terrorism. What are some other countries in the world where uh, the U.S. government has concerns that uh, uh, nuclear uh, weapons might land in the wrong hands? some like specific areas in the world? I, I don't think it's appropriate for, for us to name names in that regard. The good news is that, as Rose mentioned, the number of countries that even have nuclear material is 50% smaller than it was uh, only a couple of decades ago. So that's already a shrinkage. Um, but my concern is about the countries that, are, that uh, are complacent, the countries that are in denial about the risk of nuclear terrorism, the countries who are not stepping up to do their own responsibilities in these areas. And so that's, that's where we really have, have taken advantage of the summit opportunity to raise awareness, uh, to raise attention, and to focus leaders uh, and governments on these, on these risks. Okay, I'd like to go in the red, please. Ma'am? Um, uh, how concerned are you oh, sorry, by the- your name and your uh, It's uh, Ludmila Chernol from Sputnik News Agency. From how? Where? A Sputnik news agency, it's a Russian news agency. Uh, how concerned are you by the killing of the uh, Belgian nuclear plant guard? Uh, and if you are planning, if the United States is planning any new measures in partnership with uh, Europe 
uh, to prevent uh, nuclear materials from falling into hands of uh, terrorists. And if somebody can rate uh, the current nuclear threat, uh, the current and in uh, five years. Thank you. And we'll obviously let the Belgian officials speak for themselves, uh, but what we've seen is that the Belgians have said that, that they do not consider that particular uh, issue to be a nuclear terrorism issue. They consider it a criminal matter. Uh, we have no information to the contrary. The um, U.S. has a long history of cooperation with, with Belgium, especially through our regulatory channels, um, but also in cooperation to remove uh, highly enriched uranium and to reduce its use. And um, so we're happy to continue that work and have created, have offered our support uh, and assistance to, Be to Belgium as they move forward. Okay, I see we have a question from New York. Uh, please, what, if you could state your name and outlet, please. Thank you. Hi, Jen Tan with China News China, following up on U.S.-China cooperation. Uh, concerning the North Korea nuclear threat issue, how would you ask explain their stance to China during this summit? And secondly, during this current presidential race in the U.S., we've seen um, conflict guidelines from different presidential candidates, including the leading candidate suggesting the ally should uh, develop or building the nuclear weapons. So is it just a posturing or could the next administration really go against the long-held ideal of NMPT? Thank you. First of, all, first of all, I'd like to uh, talk about the great cooperation that we have had with Beijing in this period of developing the UN Security Council resolution that addresses uh, the grave threat we see uh, emanating from the testing of a nuclear device in DPRK in January and uh, from uh, some advanced missile tests since. Uh, these have been very concerning matters, and uh, it's been very good to see how the entire UN Security Council has been able to come together and to put in place an unprecedented UN Security Council resolution in uh, terms of its, uh, of its strength. And uh, we will continue now working very closely with China. And I have been quite heartened in my interactions with my Chinese counterparts, the degree to which China joins with us in a very strong and intensive focus on ensuring good, solid implementation of the UN Security Council resolution, which, as many of you know, uh, places uh, strong constraints <laughs> on North Korea's uh, ability to continue to conduct commerce across its borders, whether by sea, air, uh, or, uh, or land. So I think it's a very strong, uh, the, as I always like to say, the proof, proof of the pudding is in the making. So now we have to ensure strong implementation of the UNSCR, and thus far our cooperation with China on this has been, has been very, very good. Uh, if I may just comment, uh, the United States is entirely committed to the strength of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the Non-Proliferation Treaty regime. We have excellent partners across the world in the implementation of the three pillars of the NPT, disarmament, non-proliferation, and peaceful nuclear uses. And uh, among uh, our partners on implementation of the NPT, our Asian uh, colleagues and allies in Japan and the ROK are among our strongest and uh, most, uh, I would say, assiduous partners in implementation of NPT obligations. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the center. Thank you. This is Lalit Jha from PTI Press Trust of India. My first question is to Laura. Uh, India's prime minister is coming here uh, to attend the summit. What role do you see for India in the nuclear security summit this latest round? And to the Under Secretary, last week uh, before a Congress, uh, congressional uh, hearing, you had expressed concerns of a Pakistan's deployment of uh, weapon-grade nuclear weapons. Uh, why you are so concerned about it? Can you, exp uh, can you explain it a little bit more? Well, we are certainly looking forward to Prime Minister Modi's visit. And uh, we are looking at this opportunity as a chance to highlight uh, steps that India has taken in its own nuclear security to uh, go beyond, perhaps, some of the uh, activities that it has done before. And uh, we really would, would like to see an uh, even deeper bilateral cooperation with India proceed. 
uh, going forward out of these summits. So uh, I hope that that will be uh, something that we can work on more closely going forward. If I may uh, answer the second part of the question, uh, first of all, we have a very solid cooperation with Pakistan on nuclear security. They have uh, developed their own nuclear security center of excellence in recent years. It is quite a mature capability now. We continue to work with them on the nuclear security front. Our concerns regarding uh, the continuing deployment of battlefield nuclear weapons uh, by Pakistan relate to a reality of the situation. When battlefield nuclear weapons are deployed forward, they can represent a nuclear, enhanced nuclear security threat. Uh, it's more difficult to sustain positive control over systems that are deployed uh, forward. We found this lesson ourselves out in Europe during the years of the Cold War. And so I do think that uh, that is uh, a, a reality of the situation. It's not related uh, particularly to any one country. Wherever battlefield nuclear weapons exist, they represent particular nuclear security problems. Thank you. Gentlemen in the front on the end. Thank you. Uh, hi, Stefan Grober, Euronews, European Television. Um, what impact does the de facto absence of Russia have uh, on your on your work? And uh, looking ahead, we've heard that this is the last uh, summit as we know it. Um, what is what is your sense? Uh, what can we expect uh, going forward? Is this be going to be a landmark summit in the you know annual uh, uh, international diplomatic calendar? Uh, if not, why not? What is, your, what is your assessment? So in terms of your first question regarding Russia, we're, we're, we regret Russia's decision not to participate uh, in the preparatory meetings uh, for the Nuclear Security Summit or in the summit itself. As far as we were concerned, we left the door open to Russia's participation uh, until they stated publicly in September that they did not intend uh, to attend the summit. Um, as, as uh, we've discussed, uh, this group has made a lot of progress, and, and Russia has previously been, been part of that progress, although I think it's also fair to say that they have not used the summit to highlight their own work in this area. Uh, they've chosen other venues uh, to, to bring that forward. Uh, we do believe that this is a unique uh, mechanism to spur more aggressive action towards success on important uh, security priorities such as this. And we really hope that Russia, um, who after all hosted the very first nuclear security summit back when it was still the G7 plus one in 1996, I think all three, Rose and Liz and I may all have been in Moscow for that meeting. Um, they, we hope that Russia still shares the view uh, that securing nuclear materials and combating nuclear terrorism are priorities well worth the personal attention of world leaders. Uh, in, in terms of uh, what happens going forward, um, obviously the uh, the summit is not intended to constrain any future leader uh, from convening their colleagues to discuss nuclear security. Uh, this has been a hallmark of President Obama, and so there was a logic uh, to concluding this particular format uh, with, with uh, his administration. It was also a decision of world leaders taken at the summit in 2014 in The Hague that they felt that this was a good opportunity to move um, the energy of the summits into the enduring and durable international institutions. And so this is why we'll be releasing these action plans that chart a more um, active and effective path forward for these five enduring institutions. And in terms of a regular landmark on the national calendar, we really hope that the IAEA's regular ministerial meeting on nuclear security, that they will hold the second version of this this December and they will hold regularly going forward that that will be able to carry some of the momentum of the senior level attention and also of the deliverables of the it being a moment for countries to bring forward and present to the world their progress their pledges their outcomes in in their own work on nuclear security and that is the way we have treated uh, this conference um, Secretary of Energy Moniz uh, led the US delegation at the very first in 2013 uh, of these conferences, and we use that as an opportunity to bring forward several uh, cooperative and national uh, activities uh, that we're doing on nuclear security. We will be doing the same thing in December, and I'm really pleased that Secretary Moniz uh, will also be leading the U.S. delegation at that point. We hope that other countries represent at an appropriately senior ministerial level, um, and that that helps that, that particular uh, conversation 
both broaden the participation to all of the member states of the International Atomic Energy Agency and carry it forward with a, a structure uh, that has an enduring uh, capability. And so we're looking to other summit countries and other countries to join us in that ambition for that meeting. Let's turn to New York, please. Um, hello there. Thanks for the briefing. Uh, James Reinel from Al Jazeera. Um, before this briefing, I spoke to a number of experts who work in this field. Um, they're not doomsayers, but they present a pretty uh, bleak portrait of where we stand. They recognize the developments and improvements over recent years, um, but they point to significant gaps in the international architecture for nuclear security. Some of the things they pointed out to me were uh, a lack of uh, international framework for keeping tabs on radiological sources, uh, no focus on plutonium, and uh, no focus on military materials. They uh, also think that the five agency follow-up process when the world leaders finish their task this week is going to be insufficient. I'm not saying that this is the responsibility solely of the US. Of course, every country has got to play their part. But you know, they're saying there are still big gaps, and there are going to be big gaps on Friday when everyone goes home. Are you worried about that? We obviously see it a little bit differently. Um, I think to suggest that uh, radioactive sources has been ignored is an absolute misnomer. Uh, radi radioactive sources have been covered in every summit. Uh, there have been specific gift baskets highlighting steps that countries will take towards securing radiological sources, and we've seen a significant improvement in that uh, over the last years, especially since the 2014 summit in which I believe something like 30 countries committed to secure all of their most dangerous sources. And most of those countries, according to the Nuclear Threat Initiative, have met that pledge. Um, similarly, uh, we expect uh, to see further work on radioactive sources uh, at this summit. Um, plutonium has always been part of the summit process. Uh, to suggest that there's no focus on plutonium, I think, misstates uh, both the text of the documents and the reality that we are always talking about security of these, of these materials. In many cases, these materials are part of our removals efforts uh, and uh, are part of the um, responsibility that every nation has to secure any plutonium uh, that it holds. In 2014, there were specific pledges made on, on plutonium that countries would limit the accumulation of plutonium uh, to what is absolutely needed within their own nuclear energy structures. And in terms of military material, once again, every nuclear security uh, summit communique has explicitly referenced that material in weapons is covered uh, by the commitments made, by the pledges made uh, for, for security of that material. And the United States in 2014 uh, put, put forward some very explicit statements about our own security of military materials. Uh, we expect to, to make some similar statements this year. The uh, reality is that that conversation is not one that is uh, going to be constructive, held in a, in a multilateral environment. That's a conversation that is better kept uh, to those countries who actually have such material. And uh, certainly we're hopeful we've had that, we've used the summit to have those conversations. And we're hopeful that those conversations can continue uh, in other forums and venues, perhaps the, the P5 plus process that, that Rose has so ably led. So um, we uh, certainly believe there's more to be done. Uh, and I'll be the first to say that. And I've said that already. Uh, and those are some of the areas where more can be done. Claudia, center, please. Hi, Claudia Trevisan from the Brazilian newspaper Estado de São Paulo. So I can't hear you at all. Can you say that more loudly? It's, it's on. We just, if you could. Ah, okay. Claudia Trevisan from the Brazilian newspaper Estado de São Paulo. Can you put this summit in perspective? Like, in which way it will be different from the previous summits? And, uh, and I'd like also to know about the participation of Iran. Has Iran been, will Iran be present in the summit? Has Iran been invited? And if, how significant is the presence or the absence of Iran in these conversations? In terms of the summit participants, uh, the, the goal of the uh, summit invitees, as, as we laid out in the very first summit, 
was to not not to be a universal conversation because there are other venues in which universal conversations can be held but to rather be a representative uh, conversation among countries who have multiple different perspectives, uh, multiple different histories, uh, multiple uh, different uh, futures uh, regarding nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, and so on. And so I think uh, when you look at the, at the list of countries that is published today on the NSS 2016 website, if anyone is uh, not aware of that, uh, that will tell you all of the countries uh, that are are part of the, the summit, um, you will see this is not a like-minded group. Um, and it was explicitly intended to be diverse uh, on the theory that if we, that diverse set of countries can find consensus, that's especially powerful. Um, and that it is representative of consensus that might uh, prevail among even those countries who weren't present. Um, there was an expectation that we would only invite countries that we expected to be constructive in that process. Not necessarily like-minded, but participate effectively in that process. And in 2010, we did not uh, see that Iran uh, would be in that form. Uh, and since then, Iran has not been invited or, or participated in the summits, and they have not uh, been invited this, this time. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. This is Tejinder Singh from the European Weekly and IAT. Uh, the most, what I've been hearing till now is very generic. Have you identified any countries, zones, regions, which from where the nuclear material can be, you know, can go out or, uh, there's no particular, like uh, Belgium, Pakistan, North Korea, you know, like the, these are the, these have been around. What is new today that you have to convey this, uh, to get this uh, all heads of uh, these heads of state together and uh, experts together? If you are not naming and shaming the people who are supposed to be, you know, culprits, you can call them. Well, the purpose of the go of the summits is not to name and shame. The purpose of the of the summits is to identify steps that we can take together, and uh, certainly individual steps that individual countries can make and it's a create it's a place to create peer pressure if you will um, but you will not hear us say in an official context uh, or any other context that we have particular concerns about particular countries any nuclear material in any location is at risk and needs to be fully secured and fully protected and I would just add it's important to hear this because uh, this does not pertain exclusively to countries with military nuclear programs any country that has research reactors medical purposes, for example, countries that have nuclear power. There are sources of material spread across the world. And so we are all interdependent in the sense that those who have the least effective protection of their material put all of us at risk. And therefore, we have to come together through this process to work collaboratively to strengthen capabilities worldwide. And if I could just make one last point, uh, Laura's already made reference to the website for the Nuclear Security Summit. I, I commend it to all of you. It does have some nice, uh, you know, simple kind of graphics that will give you some sense of, of the detail uh, that you're seeking. We chose not to go through step by step everything that's been done, but there are fact sheets and so forth available there. So if you are interested in digging down deep in, in the way you, sir, obviously are, it's a very good source. I will just make one more plug uh, for the Nuclear Threat Initiative's Nuclear Security Index. If you're looking for some place that does rate uh, countries, you can find their ratings uh, on their website. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to have one question here, and then we'll go to New York. Thank you. So, first here. Hello, my name is Lara Wiedeking. I am with ZDF German Television. And um, despite the administration's accomplishments, if you look at the problems with Russia since late 2014, if you look at the risk of a dirty bomb that we've talked about in the hands of terrorists, um, some experts would argue that nuclear security has, in fact, worsened since 2019. Uh, since 2009, and that only improved. What would you respond to that? Well, perhaps I'll, I'll start on uh, Russia. We have, Laura already uh, spoke about uh, our disappointment that Russia did not participate uh, in this nuclear security summit. They participated in the three preceding ones and indeed 
it was President Yeltsin in 1996 who hosted the very first uh, nuclear security summit. So mm -hmm. there's no question that Russia has had a vigorous uh, policy with regard to nuclear security, and we have worked together in uh, close uh, cooperation and partnership over the years. For example, Russia uh, just took upon itself the responsibility to uh, remove the highly enriched uranium from Iran pursuant to uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So close cooperation with uh, Russia continues in a number of areas. For those of you who are interested in the wider picture, we do continue to work with them on implementation of the New START Treaty. And despite the severe crisis and our differences uh, with Russia over their incursion into Ukraine, they continue to implement the New START Treaty in a very businesslike manner. The last example that I will mention is our project in 2013 and 2014 to remove 1,300 tons of chemical weapons from Syria. Not nuclear, of course, but very important at this moment in history to ensure that uh, the declared chemical stockpile from the Assad regime was fully removed from uh, Syria. And uh, we worked very hard on that with an international consortium, but Russia was a full partner in that effort. So the best thing I can say is it's a mixed picture. There are areas of very sound cooperation with Russia where we are proceeding and continuing to make progress, but in other areas, uh, frankly, we're scratching our heads a bit as to why, for example, they are not going to be represented here in Washington uh, at the Nuclear Security Summit. And I'll just make a point that many of the accomplishments of the Nuclear Security Summits are irreversible. Uh, the, when you remove material from countries, that's a permanent elimination of that particular threat. And we've done that for 14 countries and Taiwan uh, since the Nuclear Security Summit. So those are countries where there's no point in a nuclear terrorist going there because there's nothing them there for them to steal. And if you look you know, even more broadly, as Rose said, we've reduced the number of countries with nuclear material by 50 percent uh, in, in the, since the beginning of our, of our work uh, on this issue several decades ago. Um, we've also seen that uh, countries are improving their, almost every country that's been part of the nuclear security summit process has enhanced their own domestic regulations governing nuclear security. That's a critical baseline and that's where you get actually the implementation and the enforcement of nuclear security is at the national level because there is no international watchdog uh, that enforces that. And so that's a major improvement as well. Um, we've also uh, come much closer uh, to bringing into legal force some of the critical uh, treaties, and Rose talked about why those treaties are so important uh, in terms of creating the basis for prosecution, but also creating a legal responsibility to secure material. Uh, and we have been uh, pushing hard to uh, get the amendment of, of the S Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials entered into force. Uh, we've seen a quadrupling of the uh, countries who have ratified that treaty since the summit's uh, process. Um, and so we've, uh, there's always a requirement to uh, recognize the evolution of nuclear security. So the threat evolves, and which is part of what's underlying your, your question. Uh, it's not the same world that it was in 2009. On the other hand, uh, our security in the, within the United States and globally is also evolving, and that's part of what needs to be continued uh, into the future beyond the summits as, as part of the enduring responsibility of states uh, and, the, and the international cooperative system. Could I add to this point, because I think it's important to note that in addition to all the work on removals, uh, one of the major uh, focuses of this endeavor has been to make countries aware of their responsibility with regard to the material on their territory. And so the summit network of Sherpas, Laura as the Sherpa now, um, is a community of people assigned by their governments to think every day about how to enhance the security of the material that they have in their, within their borders. And how to work collaboratively across borders to strengthen the international capacity to secure materials, prevent the uh, movement of material, and apprehend it. And so I'd like to note something that we did that was unique in January. In the Department of Energy, we hosted with uh, the Netherlands, uh, which had been the uh, summit host in 2014, as I indicated. We hosted a nuclear security exercise at our Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California for energy ministers from around the world, from the summit countries. And the focus of this exercise was on challenging 
those who would have responsibility in a crisis to think about how they would respond and whether they had the tools at their disposal necessary. Uh, in the case of the uh, acquisition by a fictitious terrorist organization of um, highly enriched uranium that had uh, gotten out of regulatory control. And uh, the, the conclusions of the ministers who participated uh, emphasized the importance of having national capabilities uh, that allow you to uh, quickly determine what is at risk. Uh, and if you do not have the uh, necessary capabilities at home to know who you would call to secure the assistance you would need in understanding what the nature is of the material that would be missing, uh, to have international cooperative uh, mechanisms in place so you know who to work with, in, first of all, on your borders, because many of these uh, crises would uh, most likely involve um, uh, those who are your neighbors. Um, to have a communications plan in place because the expectation and the demand for information by our citizens grows every day as we become more networked. And finally, reinforcing the value of what we did at Livermore to exercise together because we need to practice what we would do as an international community. So I would just underscore here that you should not measure success only by the very significant things that have taken place in the removals domain, but also by the strengthening of the muscles of all the countries in the world participating in this process to prevent and, if necessary, respond to an international nuclear crisis. Anybody else? I'd like to turn to New York, please. Hi, my name is Gina Di Meo. I'm from the Italian War Service. More than once, President Obama has said that Europe should do more uh, against the uh, terrorist attacks. Do you know if uh, this more will be discussing discusses during the summit, and it, what would be this more? Also, given the fact that there's going to be a special meeting, if I can call it the way, on ISIS and the migrant service, and also something specifically related to Italy, since the country is very exposed uh, due to its geographical position. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I didn't understand. Italy is very uh, exposed due to its geographic yes. ah, position. Okay. Um, so I understood the, there was a question about um, the, how counterterrorism will be addressed at the summit. And um, the, the final session of the summit will uh, include a discussion on counterterrorism, building out from a discussion of nuclear terrorism, of a specific nuclear terrorism scenario. Um, not as elaborate as uh, the Apex Gold exercise that, uh, that Liz referenced, uh, but, they, um, but that will provide a, a starting point for, for leaders to talk about how their steps taken during the summit has improved their ability to address a nuclear terrorism event, but then going more broadly to discuss counterterrorism and counter-ISIL uh, more generally. And so uh, that decision was made months ago. Uh, this has been in the works for quite a while, and all of the summit participants are aware uh, that this was intended to be part of this conversation. Um, and so uh, we, we hope, uh, we, we had no idea at the time uh, that it would be as tragically timely uh, as it is given of world events. But I have confidence that the leaders will, will have a very interesting and, uh, and uh, meaningful discussion uh, on that issue uh, when they're together on Friday afternoon. I think I'd like to take something from the back. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Anatoly Bachinin, TASS News Agency, Russia. Uh, follow up on um, Russian <laughs> side. Uh, Russia is not officially part of this summit, but can we expect that um, some representatives, maybe from Rosatom, will be in Washington these days? Thank you. It is, it is my understanding that none of our counterparts at Rosatom will be participating in the summit. We do have ongoing bilateral dialogue with Rosatom uh, outside of the summit process right now. Uh, and I will note that a Rosatom observer participated uh, as an observer in the Apex Gold exercise that I described at Livermore Lab, because we have had such uh, meaningful work in the past with Rosatom on nuclear security. Thank you very much. Jennifer Chen with Shenzhen Media Group, China. I would like to know um, 
How, so how to put a unified international standard for security of a nuclear security among different countries? And also, what we can expect about the updated technology on uh, preventing the cyber attack uh, in the summits? And for the US-China uh, Nuclear Security Center, what uh, specific project we can expect this year? And uh, is there possible, I mean, the possibility in the future on the cooperation uh, in the military field. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll take the first two and, and let Liz uh, talk about the second one. Uh, in terms of, of binding standards, uh, it has been the judgment of the international community uh, not to create those uh, through treaty mechanisms uh, and uh, that the IAEA provides guidance, uh, not uh, legally binding standards. When the uh, 2005 amendment uh, to the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials enters into force, that will become the closest thing we have to binding global standards on nuclear security because they will take those, those guidance documents uh, and the principles, the fundamentals of the IAEA guidance, and that will become accepted as a legally binding standard on those countries who have accepted that. Uh, treaty. So we're very eager to have this treaty come into force to fill that gap uh, in the nuclear security architecture. On cyber, uh, there have been, in 2014, there was a important gift basket or joint statement coming out of the Nuclear Security Summit in The Hague on information security that the UK had sponsored. And we're expecting them to put forward a, another uh, piece on the intersection of cyber security and nuclear security. Um, and that, in fact, was uh, a part of the, the Apex Gold exercise as mm -hmm. well. So it's very much in the, eye, in, in the mind of the leaders uh, and on the agenda of the summits and also on the agenda of the International Atomic Energy Agency. They hosted their first ever international conference on what they call computer security uh, as it relates to nuclear security last summer. And we hope that they will continue uh, to develop guidance and support for member states uh, on the cyber issue. And I'll just add that on the Center of Excellence, uh, our Secretary of Energy brought engineers and scientists from four of our national laboratories to China last week, from our Los Alamos National Lab, from Sandia National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab, and our Pacific Northwest National Lab uh, for the opening of the center. And we will be collaborating with our Chinese partners to identify the best opportunities for strengthening nuclear security going forward. Okay, we have time for two more questions, I think. Yes, sir, in the center. Uh, my name is Varghese George. I'm uh, from the Hindu India. Uh, Laura mentioned about uh, the scope for improving bilateral relations with India on nuclear security. Can you just expand on the measures that India may have taken in the recent past uh, to secure its own nuclear facilities? And what more do you expect India to do in the coming days? I'll let India speak for itself on those points. I'm, it's not for me to characterize their steps that they're taking. But we, every country can do better, and we're eager to work with any country who wishes to work with us to improve nuclear security. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Manar Goni, Middle East News Agency, Egypt. Uh, my question is regarding that Egypt has been calling uh, for so many years to uh, render the Middle East a free region of uh, weapons of mass destruction, including, of course, the nuclear weapons. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, is there a chance uh, that uh, the U.S. administration can promote uh, such a call or can give a hand in the efforts to uh, render the Middle East a region of uh, a free of uh, weapons of mass destruction. And another question is regarding the, you said that the terrorist groups, uh, including ISIL, the, there are concerns of uh, having uh, um, access to uh, nuclear weapons. So do you have any concerns about other groups rather than ISIL? Thank you. Perhaps I'll take the first question with regard to the um, the uh, idea of an initiative to develop a uh, weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. Uh, not only uh, are we interested in pursuing this, but we already have been. And in fact, in the uh, period of the recent NPT review conference, we were working very hard with Cairo, as well as countries across the region, 
to uh, convene a conference of all parties in the region uh, who would be parties uh, to such uh, weapons of mass destruction free zone and very keen to see that uh, conference move forward. Of course, we were also very keen that all arrangements for this conference should be freely arrived at by all of the countries around the region and that there should be consensus on uh, convening the meeting. And so uh, very hard work to do, of course. There are many disparate I interests in the region, many different countries in the region. And so we were not uh, able to succeed in the context of the review conference of the Non-Proliferation Treaty last May. But I will say that we are very keen to continue to work hard to uh, bring uh, this conference to fruition, to convene a conference on weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, to work with Egypt, to work with Israel, to work with other countries across the region to make it happen. So I note it's a very important day today. Your Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Shukri, is here in town. And uh, he, of course, is, uh, is one who takes a great interest in these matters. So I think it's important to underscore our continuing interest in working with Cairo as well as other uh, capitals across the region to make this happen. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to thank Ms. Holgate, Deputy Secretary Sherwood Randall, Under Secretary Gatamuller, and Dr. Gawadia. Thank you very much. This concludes our briefing today. I wish you all a good afternoon and safe travels this week as the conference continues.